and Boone. Uh, I'm, my area of research is uh, ethics, and uh, yet I was uh, somewhat surprised to be asked to do this because I hadn't uh, formally thought of myself as being identified with the humanity of lawyers, and I thought, uh, what will I do? Um, but I was assured that many of the audience are uh, from the general public tonight, and I thought it might therefore be useful to uh, say something about the origins of the, uh, the uh, bar, which Justine has just uh, told us about, and uh, uh, some of the theory that underpins that. So lawyers uh, don't always get a good press, we know that, um, and that's partly because of this uh, social role that they perform, uh, and I'm going to be suggesting that it's a valuable uh, social role, and even more so today, despite the uh, challenges to the bar that uh, Justine's outlined there. And I'm going to start with uh, a quote from Robert Gordon, who is one of the leading scholars on legal professions in the uh, US, if you mind Justine. Uh, what Gordon says is that uh, originally lawyers supplied the ideological rationales for the great bourgeois revolutions of England, France, and America by converting the specialized technical languages of law into a general discourse of liberty and rights. The common law, for example, was turned from a collection of writs and specialized sciences of pleading and property interests into a repository of public law maxims and fundamental law with constitutional rights of free born Englishmen and eventually of uh, all men everywhere. So that's a big claim, in a way, uh, for the influence of uh, lawyers on our society. But it uh, reflects the fact that lawyers were central to a number of transitions in society occurring in the 17th and 18th century uh, with the emergence of the rule of law, uh, the separation of uh, the powers of the state formerly uh, more securely vested in the monarch and now split between a legislature, an executive, and a judiciary. And, uh, as I say, the, uh, the fundamental importance of the so-called rule of law in establishing and supporting uh, this framework of rights, which lawyers uh, not only uh, help to, uh, to uh, forward politically, which they did, obviously, as uh, leading members of and so forth, but through their actions as lawyers in bringing cases in the courts and establishing rights to assembly, free speech, and free press, and so forth. Okay, so what do I mean by the rule of law? Well, this is a very nice uh, diagram. It's a slippery idea, the rule of law. You see it banded about um, quite freely uh, and almost daily in the press and on the radio. Um, this model is one devised by an American academic called Brian Tamana Hart, and what uh, it suggests there is that there are, uh, you can represent the rule, the rule of law on two lines. The first is the various formal versions of the rule of law, uh, going from what he calls a thin version, uh, where uh, the government is, uh, uses law as an instrument of action, uh, second to formal legality, where law is general, respected, clear and certain. And then thirdly to a form of the rule of law, which is democratic and you know, involves a lot of democratic consent. And an, 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 another axis there, uh, with sub substantive versions going from rights to property contracts and so forth, through the right of dignity and justice to more social welfare. And Manahar says that most of the world, including America and this country are firmly placed in the middle of both of the lines, i.e. we are committed to a kind of a formal legality uh, which recognises the right and dignity of the individual and uh, the idea of justice. So that's where we are, that's what the rule of law uh, means to us. And obviously uh, lawyers' a role in relation to this is to is something that was handled in tandem with the judiciary. As Hazard and Donnie say, 
the effective rule of law uh, depends on a legal profession sufficiently autonomous to invoke the authority of an independent judiciary. And so you get the role of the lawyer, the standard conception of the uh, lawyer's role, is based on an American reading of the American uh, Bar Association's Code of Conduct, which suggests that it has three uh, basic components. The idea of neutrality, partisanship, and non-accountability. Neutrality meaning that uh, lawyers are not morally judgmental. The client comes to them, whatever they think of the client, whatever they think of the cause, uh, they are supposed to represent them. Lawyers are partisan. They uh, don't, uh, don't change the nature of their representation, depending on what they think of the client. They are supposed to give every client uh, their best shot. Uh, and finally, because of the nature of the role, the social importance, uh, they are not accountable for the moral consequences of uh, representation. So these are the, uh, the fundamental elements of the standard conception. And uh, it's arguable that this orientation of uh, lawyers in our society is central to the development of the liberal state, which recognizes uh, civil rights, uh, uh, political rights, and economic rights uh, of a liberal nature. Uh, I want to mention two uh, leading figures that I think uh, illustrate the, the part that lawyers played in the evolution of this orientation. The first is Thomas Erskine, uh, who was uh, the defense lawyer in, in the uh, trial of Tom Paine in 1792. Erskine was from an arist aristocratic family, but was brought up uh, uh, in very limited circumstances in Edinburgh by his uh, mother, came to London, established the career at the bar from virtually nothing, um, but uh, established a position of some uh, repute and appeared for Tom uh, Paine, the author of The Rights of Man, who was persona non grata with the state for, uh, as they saw it, putting the case for a, a revolution on English soil. And so, Payne was charged with a seditious libel, and uh, Erskine defended him. The Attorney General uh, said in his address to the jury, there's no doubt that Payne is guilty, and it is shameful that a man such as uh, Erskine should uh, represent him. And Erskine's response is uh, long, I won't read it all, uh, but the key bit is he says that uh, from the moment that any advocate can be permitted to say that he will or will not stand between the Crown and the subject who reign in the court where he daily sits to practice from that moment the liberties of England are at an end. So you have here a very uh, strong uh, evocation of this idea of neutrality. You cannot associate the advocate uh, with the cause, and this gives the advocate obviously the freedom to, to represent the cause in the way that they think is appropriate. Then we have another uh, uh, ad uh, leading advocate at the time uh, who, uh, <coughs> whose uh, uh, representation is often taken to uh, exemplify the, uh, the principle of partisanship, that's Henry Brougham, who represented uh, Queen Caroline in uh, a trial brought by George IV in 1820. Caroline uh, was married to the Prince of Wales, George. Uh, it was an arranged marriage. Uh, it never was uh, a, a thing of beauty from the start. They were introduced in a room of people and uh, uh, their hatred was uh, almost immediate, and uh, they spent a, a, a very short time together, apparently, at the start of their marriage. She uh, then took a series of lovers, went abroad, and George spent the next several years trying to uh, get rid of her by proving her adultery. Um, she came back, however, when he acceded to the throne and wished to be queen. 
and uh, he was somewhat taken aback by this, as you might imagine, and brought a bill to Parliament uh, of this is her trial in Parliament uh, of uh, pain and proclamations uh, to try and have her divorced and uh, disgraced. And Brougham represented her and uh, again, as I say, evoking this principle of partisanship, said, uh, thank you Judith, an advocate in the discharge of his duty knows that one person in all the world and that person is his client. And then at the end, separating the duty of a patron, patriot from that of an advocate, he must go on reckless of consequences, though it should be his unha unhappy fate to involve his country in confusion. And this was no idle threat, because what he was uh, implying he would do, if this uh, case continued, was to expose the fact that George was illegally married to a woman called Maria Fitzherbert at the uh, time that he also married uh, to, uh, Caroline of Brunswick. So uh, the duty of partisanship is extreme. It, uh, it, it, it covers almost any action, if you like, in order to, uh, to assist the client. So you have here the, the, the standard conception which the Bar of England uh, probably represents uh, as perfectly as almost any legal profession in the world. And does it need to continue to do so? I think so, because the challenge to the rule of law, as I say, is almost daily uh, and continuous and it's uh, uh, taking constantly new forms. So uh, only the past year or so, you could find a number of instances of people who challenge the state, who are so non-grata, who, uh, who uh, we may say,